So let's summarize where we are for the Gaussian integers and the sum of squares problem. Um, so it's a fact, and this, proving this goes just a little bit beyond what I want to do, that unique factorization does hold in the Gaussian integers just as it holds in the ordinary integers. Uh, don't worry, we'll see a case where it doesn't uh, very soon, because uh, that's really the interesting part. Uh, or Well, this is already interesting. So uh, if p is an ordinary prime in the integers, and if minus 1 is the square mod p, and the claim is that that's just either p equals 2 or p is an odd prime that's 1 mod 4, then uh, a squared plus 1 squared is kp. So that's another way to say that minus 1 is a square mod p. Uh, then p divides a plus i times a minus i, because that's a clever way to write this using Gaussian integers. So this is the step from here to here where we've really moved to the Gaussian integers. And um, therefore, and since p does not divide either factor, that's something fishy about p. Namely, p is not prime by definition in the Gaussian integers. And here's where we use the unique factorization. That means that all p is also not irreducible, so it must factor. It's not hard to show, that was the exercise from a few videos ago, that it must factor in the special way of uu bar, or x plus yi, x minus yi, and voila, we've exhibited p as the sum of two squares. So that's a, a, sum, a summary of basically everything I've done so far. Um, and it turns out the most subtle step is this connection between prime and irreducible, and that really relate that really relies on unique factorization holding the Gaussian integers. Okay, so now what about other related problems? Remember, originally I was saying we really are interested in uh, x squared plus dy squared, and we're looking at maybe trying to solve all those problems to see what they have in common. And this is where um, it really gets interesting. So. Just like before, we're just going to solve this for primes. The same kind of arguments apply. I won't go, go through them, but they're very similar. To show that the, by far the most important thing to do is to figure out what happens for primes. OK, so we're going to replace this with a p. And do this, we can do the same algebra about um, quadratic residues. We can write this as x squared plus 5y squared congruent to 0 mod p. That's still mod a prime, so we can still divide. And we can just do a little algebra to say, oh, OK, now it's minus 5 that's congruent, oops, that should be a congruent, sorry, congruent to a square mod p. Okay, so that's still a straightforward problem. Um, it's the quadratic residue problem, and so let's set up the table. Okay, turns out that uh, if we look at is minus 5 a square mod p, that's an easy question to answer. Um, notice that, um, uh, let's see, oh yeah, I, I want to say something uh, in a minute about that about sort of the sizes of things, but let's do this first. So here we have minus 5, uh, yes, uh, it's congruent to 1 squared mod 2, because minus 5 is odd and 1 squared is odd, okay? Mod 3, 1 squared, that's just 1, and I can claim that's congruent to minus 5, because if you move it over, 1 plus 5 is 6, that's multiple of 3, okay? Here, 5, of course, oh, minus 5 is congruent to 0 because it's a multiple of 5. And here it's not hard to verify that mod 7, minus 5 is congruent to 9, congruent to 3 squared. The only other one up through tw prime 23 where it actually, minus 5 is congruent to a square, is down here where you can check that minus 5 is congruent to 8 squared. Because 8 squared is 64, that's 5 less than 69, which is a multiple of 23. So you probably want to go through these carefully and pause the video and see make, you make sure that I understand that part. So I'm going to say eligible if minus 5 is a square mod p. We know that if that fails, there's just absolutely no way that we could take p and express it as x squared plus 5y squared by the, the analog of the arguments that we had before. Um, but what we had before is that these columns matched up, basically that anything that was eligible was actually good. And now it's, it's, we see that it's actually failing big time. Here's a case where it was eligible. And yes, it's a sum uh, p, 5 is 0 squared plus 5 times 1 squared. Great, OK? And here's 7 is, oops, that should be a yes. Uh, oops, <laughs> no, it shouldn't be. I'm just, uh, that's just wrong. Boom, OK. Um, so 7 cannot be written as 
a square plus 5 times the square. You can check it. Okay. Um, and so we're getting a major failure here that there's places where this test in terms of uh, the quadratic residue is failing to accurately predict whether something is a sum of squares. Now one thing again about this eligible issue uh, and that's that this is going to be periodic mod 20. Remember I have this claim again one of these things I haven't proved for you is that when I look at the question is minus 5 a square mod p that's going to repeat when I increase p by 20. So this really is some, a pattern that's just going to keep repeating over and over again because I've gone up from 2 to 23. So that's just trying to emphasize that if, this, if there were a tight link between these two columns, we'd be home free because we would totally understand this guy and then we'd totally understand which things can be expressed as x squared plus 5y squared. That's why it's so disappointing to have the link be broken. Okay. Another thing that I wanted to mention is what kinds of numbers we're interested in here. Um, whenever we're looking at this kind of question with you know n equals x squared plus dy squared, um, we're usually interested in the case where n is much greater than d. Okay, if it's not much greater than d, then it's really easy brute force to figure out if n can be expressed as x squared plus dy squared. If d is um, 117 or something, ooh, that's not prime, uh, maybe 109, I think that's prime, um, then, uh, and n is 200, it's really not hard to check a few y's and verify whether n can be uh, written as the, in this form, x squared plus dy squared. So we're interested in the case where n, or really we're calling it p, is much greater than d. So these cases that I'm looking at where d is minus 1 or plus 1 or 5 small numbers are really typical of the kinds of things that you'd want to analyze. So just wanted to point that out. The reason that's interesting, uh, the reason I, I just mentioned that right now, is that that 5 turned into this minus 5, which turns into this 20. So typically we're going to have that be on the small side and so we're going to get a fairly simple pattern, a pattern that repeats fairly quickly in the eligible column and that makes it uh, a really easy thing to calculate again. Unfortunately, we're seeing now an example where these don't match up. Okay, so what's the deal? All right. Well, already, if you, we look at the, the logic, it tells us that something is different here, and in fact, we can figure out exactly what's different. Okay, Let's go through real quickly the, the same kind of argument we would have had before. What we're doing when we look at a squared plus 5, or uh, x squared plus 5y squared, for some reason I just changed it to a's and b's, I'm not sure. I must have written this, I think I wrote this, wrote this much earlier. Um, if it's n equals a squared plus b squared, then I can write it in this way, a plus root minus 5b times a minus root minus 5b. This is very much like the Gaussian integers, but instead of letting yourself have use this one complex number i, we use this new one complex number and only this complex number, uh, root minus 5. And so it's all combinations of an integer plus an integer times root minus 5. Okay, that's called z adjoined root minus 5. What we can now say is that unique factorization must fail in this case. Because if you look over the arguments, what I just started this particular video with, that worked in the Gaussian integers, the only thing that could go wrong is that link between primes and irreducibles, and that's about unique factorization. And so this must fail in this case. So, let's look at a specific example. There's a very classic, simple example. If I look at 6, that factors as 2 times 3. Okay, very un unremarkable. It also factors as 1 plus root minus 5 times 1 minus root minus 5. Not too hard to verify. That's 1 minus minus 5, and so that's 1 plus 5 is 6. Now, I'm not going to show you the work to, to show you that each of these four numbers really is actually prime in z adjoined root minus 5. Um, but they are, okay, and so they're certainly irreducible. The, the two, the three, and these guys cannot be broken up into smaller pieces. Um, it's just, it's a little bit finicky work to show that. Um, and so now what we've got is six factorized in two completely different ways. And so unique factorization fails, okay, and remember why we really cared about that. The particular little lemma that we cared about was, let's go back up here, um, it's that, right, it's that when p divides a product, but p does not divide each of the factors, it can't factor itself, okay? So let's look at that in this case, okay? 
So here we've got something where 2 times 3 and 1 plus or minus root minus 5 are both uh, multiplying to be the same thing. Okay, So um, that's exactly the kind of case where that we was talking about before that breaks this wonderful lemma. Okay, So this really explains why the patterns of the yeses don't line up. And this is, gets us to our punchline. Okay, the key difference here in these different situations is unique factorization. It was true for the integers. It's true for the Gaussian integers, which is where we allow ourselves to take the root of minus 1, but nothing else. And it's false for when we adjoin the root of minus 5 to the integers. And here's the why 163, or really minus 163, is such an interesting number. If you look, remember, we're only interested in square-free numbers for d, because it's pretty trivial to analyze stuff that has a square factor. So if I just look at all the square-free positive numbers, such that if I take the negative of that number, take the square root to produce some multiple of i, adjoin it to z, and I ask, does that... Uh, does that ring, it's called a ring, this kind of algebraic object, does that ring have unique factorization? Turns out that these are the, the numbers. And so if you'd say to a number theorist, oh, um, yeah, let's look at some totally random number, uh, let's say minus 163, they'll stop you and they say, whoa, that's not random. That is not a random number at all. That is a very interesting number. It's as far as you can go with this story of the, 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 the sort of sum of squares kind of story and still have this simple result that we got when d was equal to 1 for the Gaussian integers. That a simple test based on quadratic residues tells you when you can have the sum of squares phenomenon. So if you're going to solve uh, you know, n, if you're going to look for when is n equals x squared plus 163 y squared, that has a relatively straightforward answer. If you're going to try n equals x squared plus 167 y squared, that's likely to have a much more complicated answer. So basically, in the negative direction, if you have this be positive, and therefore what you en end up adjoining is the square root of a negative number, this is the farthest you can go, minus 163, and have something like ordinary arithmetic um, holding, and not have to do a lot more work. Um, if you look at the positive d's, okay, if I look at the, the equation x squared minus dy squared is equal to n. Um, we actually started out with the case where d equals 1 here, with x squared minus y squared equals n, and it was actually really simple. Uh, it, was our, it was our toy case where we realized that factorization was going to be interesting, and we didn't need complex numbers. Notice this is not a complex number. It could be like square root of 2, square root of 5. You might think that's a lot easier because complex numbers have a reputation for being complicated. In fact, uh, it's really much, much trickier as, long as, you, as soon as you get away from d equals 1. Um, unique factors, the same kinds of ideas hold, though. The same logic holds. If unique factorization holds, we get simple answers. Um, but the, the set of d's for which unique factorization hold is not known. And um, it's conjectured to be an infinite list. Um, you can look it up on Wikipedia or the online encyclopedia of in integer sequences. Um, but it's a rather complicated list of numbers, and nobody really knows exactly what that list is. And we don't even know whether it's a finite or infinite list. Okay, So uh, in the last video, I'm going to give you kind of an epilogue. We've seen now a really important reason to care about unique factorization and why minus 163 is so important. Um, but I still haven't told you, if you remember this, the subtitle for the very first talk, I claim 23 is an interesting number in a similar context. And in an epilogue, I want to give you another reason to care about unique factorization and uh, why 23 comes into that.